Good morning. My name is Cor. I'm on the pastoral staff here at Hope. Um, yeah, welcome. Welcome to Hope. Thank you for braving the uh, snow-covered roads, uh, digging yourselves out. I was really excited when I got to the, the highway. I mean, uh, praise God for snow plows and uh, wasn't so bad. Um, if, if we were playing a game of who's been to the ER most recently, I might not be the gold medalist, but I, I think I'd make the podium. I think I'd be top three. I got home uh, about 8 p.m. Uh, last night from the <laughs> ER. I, uh, I, I didn't want my wife to be concerned, so this was the picture I sent her that, <laughs> it's great, I got my own room, you know, I got people taking care of me, I'm an extrovert, and I have strangers coming in every five minutes to talk to me, I get to meet somebody new, this is fantastic, why are you worried about me? Um, why I went in was uh, a combination of preaching today, um, but waking up in the middle of the night, not, not last night, but the night before, kind of Friday into Saturday, I was awoken at 3.30 with abdominal pain. And I, I sleep. When I, when I put head to pillow, I sleep, and then I wake up the next day. I don't have crazy dreams like some of you. I don't wake up several times in the night. I just sleep. Uh, that's what I do. And, and so to be awoken was new, and it took me about an hour or so to go back to sleep, and then yesterday I'm doing the, you know, is it, is it bad, is it, is it that bad, is it getting worse, is it going away, and so finally I, I decided to let uh, Steve and John know and try to come up with a game plan. If I couldn't be here, like who's on deck, who's warming up in the bullpen, uh, but, it, but if I hadn't been preaching, I, I likely would have just uh, let, it, let it be, and uh, I, I come out of that time having met a lot of new, new friends, um, but really not knowing the cause of the pain. And the, I don't know if you know this, but just because they aren't able to ascertain the cause doesn't mean that when you leave the ER that the pain goes away. It's, it's still there. Uh, and I have, uh, I don't know, I'm just a, a part of that, that group of abdominal pain people that are undiagnosed. Uh, the few, the proud, the undiagnosed, that's a... Those are my people, and that's a minority of people, but I'm, I get to be one of them. So, a couple other worthy notes. Did you, did you know that there are machines at our hospitals that to go and, and purchase would cost $4 million? Did you know that? I know that now, because the CT scan, I had to ask, like, that's some machine you got there. I mean, how much... I'm just saying, if I wanted, uh, you know, well, how, much would, how much could I get one of those for? And she said $4 million. And then she said, yeah, the, the crazy thing about this one is the, the camera wasn't really working, so we had to, like, swap it out. Just swapped out a $4 million machine. And I'm like, okay, is there, I mean, I'm probably going to have to pay for this on the back ends of, of all this somehow. Could we just do, like, a Polaroid or... Self, can I take a selfie and maybe cut down the cost for me? Um, but, but I uh, went through all of this, and toward the end, um, I had multiple encounters with this, this doctor. He came in, and, and he was ripped, and so I said, wow. Uh, I said, how, how much are you benching? That was my first question for the doc. Uh, and he said, ah, oh, no, no, no. I said, no, I want to know. And he wouldn't answer. <laughs> and he came in with like a scribe, somebody that's taking notes, and she's laughing. It's like, I'm, this is a serious question. <laughs> and so two other things happened by, by the end of this. Um, uh, one, one of the things is he, he, he reveals right toward the end of, of all of this that, oh, yeah, I, I recognize you. you you're a pastor down at Hope. I've seen you before. And then I kind of go back in my mind to all the things we've talked about, one of which was uh, he checked me for a hernia. So I, I like knowing the people that come to Hope. I don't want to be known <laughs> that well by all of you. 
So that was the first thing. And then the second thing was, you know, he's about to give me my release papers, and he just says, Coors, do you have any questions? You know, any other questions? And I said, yeah, how much do you bench? I was like... <laughs> But at the end of all that, and you have circ uh, circumstances in your life and experiences where you kind of just go like, what was that? Like, as I'm paging through the story of my life, and I come to yesterday afternoon, last night, this weekend, like that would be one of the questions I would ask. Like, God, what, what was that? What, why did I go through that? What role did that ha have to play in my life? Was that so I could drive home on just snow-covered highways, kind of off-roading it? Like, what was, what was that? In today's story, I can imagine that question being asked of the text that we're going to go through. Just like, what was that? Maybe that's Moses asking the, that question to God. Certainly a Bible reader asking that of the text. And if you are a small group leader, taking your group through Exodus with us, you've asked that question, like, what, what was that? Why is that in there? And you actually have to lead a conversation, a small group study. Uh, you're not going to be asking that question, like, what, what was that? Can we just go on to the next passage? Because I'm telling you, pastors and preachers and leaders that, that kind of go into Exodus and preach on certain texts, they don't preach on what we're going to be talking about today. Because they go, well, what was that? I'm just going to go on to chapter 5 where Moses meets up with Pharaoh. So that's going to be kind of one of the overriding questions of our time in uh, the book of Exodus today. If you're new with us, we're going through the book of Exodus. We're at the end of chapter 4, and I do want to update you briefly on where we've been, but also highlight, we're looking at this, this book from a distinctly gospel perspective. We want to pull some of the threads, some of the, some of the points that maybe are started in Exodus and bring them through and, and up to the New Testament. Because we have this great advantage of looking at the Bible with the lens of the cross of Jesus Christ. The gospel, the good news that God saves primarily through the cross of Christ. And so we want to look at these things from a distinctly gospel perspective. But to, just to get you up to date, um, so we get to the end of Genesis, and kind of the, that whole generation is going gonna, is gonna to pass away, and a, a new pharaoh is going to be established that doesn't know the history that came forth in Genesis. And Moses is born, and Moses is an outsider. And that group of outsiders, specifically boys that were born of Hebrew, of Israelite background, were to be killed. But through the intervention of no less than five women, God spares the life of Moses. Moses ends up growing up within the, the household of Pharaoh with all these rights and privileges, wealth and education. But one day he'll go out into a field, see one of his Hebrew Israelite brothers being mistreated. And he kills the Egyptian who was mistreating him. Consequently, he flees because his life is once again under threat. He will flee all the way to a place called Midian, where he will marry, have children, and spend 40 years before God comes to him through the, the means of a talking, burning bush. Uh, it's, a, it's a rare encounter, um, but God confronts him. And we're going to pick up right at the end of that encounter between God and Moses. Moses is questioning God's ways, God's wisdom, that, that God would actually be calling him to go forth and lead the Israelite people out of slavery. That God would call Moses to go in front of Pharaoh. And so God has all these reasons why he is not to be the one. We pick it up in chapter 4, verse 13. It said, but Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. And he said, what about your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, and he will be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. 
He will speak to the people for you and it will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand so you can perform the signs with it. About this and about where Moses is at, I want to quote an African theologian. He passed away in 2010. Dr. Adu Yemo, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, is a Kenyan scholar, and he wrote an African commentary with 70 other African theologians. And why I quote him is specifically because he's not a Westerner. There's something about the authority of God that we miss oftentimes as Western people, as people that grow up in democracy, where you are, you are not just uh, open to questioning everything, you're told, question everything, question everyone. And so it is commonplace for us to dismiss authority figures. And Dr. Adayemo, I think, changes and challenges me when I think of God's voice, God's authority. Let me read for you a quote from him regarding Moses being confronted by the word of the Lord. For his part, Moses is finally ready to undertake his mission. He has been shown that he can trust the word of God. He would agree with the Baluba people group from the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo who say this, God does not discuss things with humans. What he says is right. How do we know if something is right in our culture? We debate it. We hear what authoritative figures, teachers, politicians, businessmen and women think about that. We let their opinions get out in kind of the courts of social media, and we see as they go against one another at the end of that battle which opinion continues to stand. This is different. What he is advocating is distinctly different than that. It's not Moses and Aaron, Zipporah, Joseph, Abraham. Why don't you all get together and debate this and decide from amongst you what is best, what is right? No, no, no. What he is advocating is authoritative, coming from God to us. And what makes, it, what makes it right is that it is God who is speaking. And that's all we need to know. And I find that compelling because it's inconsistent with the culture I'm from. And I don't want to be marked by just my culture. I want to be marked as a person of the word. And I need other people in other places to go, I don't know if you really understand authority. I don't know if your culture really understands authority. When God says it is right. Why? Because God said it. So that brings us up to date from where we have been. And it brings us to 14 verses that we're going to go through. And commentators suggest there are upwards of seven scene changes in these 14 verses. So we're going to move pretty quickly quickly through several different stories. Let me read for us. Beginning in verse 18, it says, Then Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Let me return to my own people in Egypt to see if any of them are still alive. Jethro said, Go. I wish you well. Now the Lord had said to Moses in Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all those who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey, and started back to Egypt, and he took the staff of God in his hand. The Lord said to Moses, When you return to Egypt, see that you perform uh, before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, This is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son, and I told you, let my son go so he may worship me. But you refused to let him go. 
so I will kill your firstborn son. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. But Zipporah took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone. At that time, she said, bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. The Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he met Moses at the mountain of God and kissed him. Then Moses told Aaron everything the Lord had sent him to say, and also about all the signs he had commanded him to perform. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people, and they believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshiped. That's our passage for today. Multiple scene shifts. If you're uh, following along on the notes, the other insert or online, you're going to see that I broke it down into six scene shifts, and we're going to walk through these. As we do, though, we're asking ourselves the question, what was that? Why did that get included? Why did Moses, as he's writing these later on, feel like those details were essential? Because at the end of the day, just let's separate, you know, we're going to look at some of the trees, but just the forest of this narrative. We got to get Moses from where he was in Midian And get him up to Egypt so he can confront Pharaoh. It's a traveling narrative, okay? And he's going to go from Midian all the way up to Egypt. That's the forest. That's what's going to happen. But as Moses is writing this account, as he's recalling that trip, he includes these details. And we're going through as a Bible reader asking, why? Why is that important? And as we do so, it's like, wow, what was that? What is going on there? So let's walk through this, and I want to remind you of something I reminded you of uh, a few weeks back, the difference between narration and narrative time, okay? Narration, all right? That's just the true length of a story. So if you have a pregnancy, the narration time is nine months, but the narrative can be three words. She was pregnant, right? That's, That's how long it took to tell that story. And so in our Bibles, we need to recognize that even though this is 14 verses, likely this would take place over weeks, maybe stretching into months. We don't know for sure, but um, days into weeks, weeks possibly into more than uh, a month's time, even though we're going through this fairly rapidly. But because of that, Moses doesn't give us a lot of details uh, in the story. You might be asking good questions of the text that just aren't answered. I have a lot of questions about this text and about these different stories and about these different accounts that just aren't answered because Moses' intent is to get through them fairly quickly and only include what he feels like are essential details. So let's walk through this now, kind of six different scenes. Starting in scene one here, Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, let me return to my own people in Egypt to see if any of them are still alive. Jethro says, go, and I wish you well. A couple things to note here. Let me return to my own people. Okay, so clearly Moses is identifying. I, I think literally it's my, my brothers, my brethren, my, my kinsmen, my brothers and sisters, okay? So he is identifying himself with the Hebrew people. Not with his upbringing, which was in Egypt, in Pharaoh's household, but he is identifying with the plight and the place that his people, um, of his own origin, right? Born a Hebrew, cast into the river, drawn out, And raised within Pharaoh's household, he's saying, I'm going back to my own people in Egypt. And then he says, to see if any of them are still alive. Is that really why he's going back? The burning bush? God telling him? Like, where did all that go? (laughs) Like, this wasn't just something that he concocted, this plan of like, yeah, I'm just curious. Just going to go back and just see. Just want to check out the family tree and see where people are. We don't know why he used this language. Was it that he was uh, worried about sharing the full story with his father-in-law? Maybe. Do you want to share with your father-in-law? God spoke to me. How? The bush that was on fire. Really? 
and you're going to take my daughter and my grandkids and go where and do what? You're going to confront Pharaoh? It's possible. We don't know for sure. So, with that said, why include this? Seems like we're going to circle back to Jethro in chapter 18, just enough to say, hey, he might not be a key player, but, but keep that name in mind. We'll, we'll circle back to him in about 14 chapters. Um, so, is it critical? We don't know how critical. Uh, we'll, we'll get back to him. Um, and I know this is not the point of this for sure, but uh, if you are a student of uh, undergrad or graduate and you need to have a tough conversation about what you feel like God is calling you to, your parents or in-laws might be some of the first people you talk to. That's just a side note. That's just like a, hey, heads up, warning, uh, that's going to be coming. When I sat down with my soon-to-be father-in-law and asked if I could marry his daughter, first question to me, well, do you have any spreadsheets that are going to communicate with me and your, you know, uh, Jill's mother about how you're going to care for our daughter? And I instant, just sweating, just like, ah, uh, ah, uh, I didn't have a job, <laughs> didn't have job prospects, like, ah, uh, ah. Uh. And he goes, no, nah, I'm just kidding. I'm like, whoo, that's, that's, uh, <laughs> that was close. All right, let's keep going. <laughs> Scene number two. It says, now the Lord had said to Moses and Midian, go back to Egypt for all those who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey, and started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hand. A couple key details, okay? Go back to Egypt for all those who wanted to kill you are dead. This is not because Moses is necessarily afraid or this is some news he can bring back to Zipporah to kind of put her nerves at ease. That's probably not likely of why this is included here. What's more likely is a way of saying, hey, there are circumstances that were true about you when you were last there. Those circumstances are no longer true. It's almost like the slate has been wiped clean. God's, uh, Moses' attempt to bring forth this deliverance of his people and the failure, the utter failure that happened when he killed that Egyptian and then fled, that whole storyline is now done. And what's coming forth is God's plan, yes, going to utilize Moses, but God's plan to bring this forth. A new age, a new time has come. And I want to read briefly about this idea from uh, the New American Commentary. It was common practice in the ancient world, as it is in the modern, for a new government to cancel criminal penalties imposed by a previous government, thus granting general amnesty to prisoners and those sought by the law. Thus, for God to say to Moses, all those who wanted to kill you are dead, would likely represent news that the Pharaoh in power, when Moses killed an Egyptian, was now himself dead, along with any others, such as immediate survivors of the deceased, who might have had both the legal standing and the desire to press the case. So when it's brought up that those who wanted to kill you are dead, it's not to put him at ease, it's just to say, a new dawn has come. Now, one other point of note is that he took the staff of God in his hand. And that's how we can know that this new era is not to be marked by Moses and his courage or his boldness, okay? It's not because he's gonna be a triumphant in some sort of military victory. No, he's riding a donkey. But he takes the staff of God in his hand. The presence of God would go with him. It would be God's power, not Moses' power, that would bring about deliverance. Let's go on to scene number three. Then the Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. This increases the stakes. Previously, it was, hey, I'm gonna give you some cool miracles that you can do in order to convince the Israelites and the elders to follow. Now it's saying, no, no, you will demonstrate this before Pharaoh. You will be called to exercise these wonders in front of Pharaoh. And that last part there, and I have given you the power to do so, literally, I have put it in your hand. So we lose some of that in the, in the translation, the poetic beauty of that. God put the staff in his hand, and then he says, I have put the power. I have put it in your hand, what you need as you go forward. 
With this, I wanna grab on to a comment, uh, comment by Wright in uh, The Mission of God here, because this is important as we think about this, like what is going on? What was that? Why is this in there? He says, back then God first revealed what he intended to do. Then he did it. Then he interpreted, explained, and taught his people on the foundation of both his faithfulness to his promise and his actual saving fulfillment of it. Only the God who is actually in control of events from beginning to end could claim such comprehensive mastery of history and its meaning. The story is God's story because it is the story he is writing. The author controls the story. The Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you do this before Pharaoh, all the wonders I have given you the power to do. Then he's going to go do it. And so from beginning to end in this Exodus account, God is the author. God is writing the story. The author controls the story. The passage continues here at the end of verse 21. But even though I give you power, I put it in your hand. You're going to go perform these wonders before Pharaoh. But I will harden his heart. So he will not let the people go. What is that? What was that? What do we make of that? I spent a tremendous uh, amount of time this week reading commentary, 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 commentary. Looked at it in my office, looked at it at my house, looked at it last night as I'm sitting in the ER. Peter N. says, there is little one can do to make this verse say something different. There's no way that we can honor the text and wiggle out from how difficult this is to read, to think about, to internalize. And so I want us to just pause long enough to recognize this is difficult. I bring it up because it's the first time it's mentioned, but it won't be the last. And because it won't be the last, I'm not going to try to write the book on this, try and finish the conversation. I'm going to start the conversation. But then we're going to come back to it again and again and again. Okay, there's three different ways that this is discussed in your English translations. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Or it's just stated that his heart was hardened. And this is stated three different ways. Which is a way the Bible is saying, doesn't matter how you cut it. His heart was hardened. Stubborn toward the word of God and the work of God in his life. But where we struggle is this idea that God would be a part of the causation, that God would be a part of starting that. And so I want to read a couple other passages to start this conversation. If we're asking, what was that? What is that? Why? Okay, I want to just give you a couple things. A couple things. Again, not going to end the conversation. Not that we can know all things, because we can't. But what other passages might be beneficial to us in this? Later, 10 chapters from now, we'll read this. I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, pursue the Israelites. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. So we just walk through the passage, and we let the Bible speak. I will harden Pharaoh's heart. The result will, he'll pursue my people. The result of that was, I will gain glory for myself. And Egypt will know that I am the Lord. So if you're looking for what might be one reason, 
not the whole story, but what might be an aspect of this, that God will gain glory in that. Now, if you're truly Western people, born and raised here, you you question that immediately, just outright. Doesn't seem fair. Doesn't seem just. I want my say about how God should do this. That's our tendency, right? Do you have that in you? Just something in you going, I don't like that. I don't want that to be there. I'm going to bring you over to Romans chapter 9. I'm not going to read all of it, but going to read eight verses here. Is God unjust? Not at all. How can we know that God is not unjust? Well, he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not, therefore, depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For Scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. Does not depend on human desire or effort. Are you kidding me? That's a hard teaching. I wasn't raised to think that it's not about desire or effort. If it's to be, it's up to me. I do, I achieve, I earn, I show myself worthy. But scripture says to Pharaoh, I've raised you up for this purpose that God might display his power, that God's name might be proclaimed in all the earth. He has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy and he hardens whom he wants to harden. It continues, one of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? Verse 20, but who are you, human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? What was that? Why is that true? God, why would you put that in your Bible? God, that it, it's harder for me to trust in you when I read that, or it's harder for me to share you with my roommate or my neighbor or my family member. These are the passages, God, that make it really difficult for people to trust you. How do we know That he's not unjust because God is the one who declares it. What he declares is just. Maybe not by your standard. Maybe you want to sit in judgment over the Bible, over the text, over God, and tell him what is right and wrong, what is just and unjust. Just trying to start the conversation, not end it. Trying to preach the Bible. Might share this differently if I was sitting across from you in my office, counseling you through some struggle. And you're wondering if God is behind it as authority, as sovereign, as as a part of the cause. But I, I try to present God's word plainly, as difficult as it might be. I've never forgotten this line from Tim Keller. I was able to find it in a tweet, but it was an authoritative tweet. Um, Because I struggle, I wrestle, even as a preacher, as a believer, as having read this Bible many times, there's still passages where I go, that's hard. And I find myself sometimes saying, God, it's hard to believe in a God that does this. 
hard to believe in a God that would harden someone's heart. It's hard to believe that, to trust that. And at the heart of that kind of comment, he says, when we say, I can't believe in a God who would do blank, we're saying we don't really want a God beyond our comprehension. And when I read that and I heard that, I said, that's me. God, I want, I want you to be understandable. At all times, I want your word to be clear to me at all times. Like, is that too much to ask? That, that I can comprehend everything you do and everything you say. I want that. I desire that. Can I have that? And it's passages like the end of Romans 11 where we're cautioned, where we're warned, where we're told how unsearchable are the ways of God and his paths beyond tracing out. And yet I want to search them. And I want to trace them out. And I want to know the end from the beginning. And I want God to have so many dots so close together that I can just do that line of best fit. And yet, I have to acknowledge, we have to acknowledge that many times things are said and done that are beyond my ability to comprehend. And yet at the end of the day, I come back, God, you're good, you're just, you're right, you're true, you're noble, you're holy. I believe all those things. And so when I say what was that, I don't say it with arrogance or accusation. But I'm genuinely questioning, God, what, what was that? What were you doing? I think that's sufficient to start the conversation, though not end that conversation. Verse 22, then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son, and I told you, let my son go so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. Didn't get any easier as we kept reading. Let me quote from Tony Merida, who is an author, theologian, pastor, as he helps us understand this idea of firstborn and the importance of it. Because even though it's used only one time in the Old Testament to refer to the people of Israel, that, that God sees Israel as his firstborn son, that is a theme pulled throughout scriptures, and, and Tony's able to see that and share that with us. He says, God instructed Moses to explain the sonship, the firstbornness, of Israel to Pharaoh. God wanted to free his son to worship him. In fact, the firstborn is a theme that runs throughout the whole scriptures from Adam to Abraham to David to Jesus and to all the saints. And there's a number of passages listed there. Of course, this appeal insulted Pharaoh. Why? He believed that he alone was the sons of the gods, the son of God, the firstborn of God. So it's it's not enough that you're trying to take my slaves. You're actually saying that they're the firstborn of God and not me? We'll come back to that. Let's go on to scene four. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. But Zipporah took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you are a groom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone. At the time she said, bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. What is that? What? <laughs> what was that? What is that? Just get to Egypt. <laughs> How much can you bench? <laughs> can you bench? <laughs> There's just better questions. Oh, all right. Now, that's hard enough. Let me infuse a little bit more difficulty. Moses is actually not there in the Hebrew. Instead, there's just a male pronoun. So we don't even know for certain who is the one that the Lord is meeting. Who is the one that's about to be killed? Is it Moses? Could be, or it could be his son, the one who's going to be circumcised. Well, hold on. Is Moses getting circumcised or is it the son? Because again, we just have a pronoun. So let me just kind of do a little 
We're going we're gonna to take this as God's word, and now we're going to go over to Kor's word. Uh, so very real careful here. So, at a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and was about to kill him. Could be Moses. Could, could be like, you're not circumcised, Moses. You're not going to go forth with what I have planned for you, even though I've said that I have plans for you, and so you are in danger, and therefore you yourself need to get circumcised. Could be. I tend to lean a little bit more that the firstborn, because of what we've just come from talking about, the firstborn of Israel and the firstborn of Pharaoh from just the previous set of verses, that what is in mind here is the firstborn of Moses. So that it's the Lord met the firstborn of Moses and was prepared to kill him. Now, either reading is still difficult, and you're still going, what is that? What was that? And then you have additional information about how Zipporah circumcised and whether it was, in fact, place on Moses' feet, on the child's feet, likely, that's a euphemism for genitals, and whether it's Moses or the kids. But we know that it happens because somebody is a groom of blood. Um, Literally a blood relative. Now, it's really hard. Why? Because we don't know the emotion with which Zipporah says this. And by the way, if you're new, <laughs> you're, you're good people. I mean, you, <laughs> you shoveled yourself out and you came to hear this. Um, we don't know if she's saying this as words of judgment against this family, because again, Jethro, Midian, there's some religion going there that's not connected to the Israelites. Likely there was some form of circumcision. Many times those ancient forms of circumcision were much less severe than what we have within the Israelite religion. And so it could be that she's disgusted with this, that she's disgusted that she had to do this, or it could be a declaration of, you are a blood relative. We are one. We are in this. We don't know for sure, okay? So with all of that, what do we make of this? Well, I need to go back to Genesis 17 very briefly where the, it outlines the, the expectations of circumcision. We need to know this, okay? This is my covenant with you, God says, and your descendants after you, of which Moses is one, right? The covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with money from a foreigner. Those who are not your offspring, whether born in your household or bought with your money, they must be circumcised. My covenant is in in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So that's why this is so important. Moses and his family are heading back called of God to do something, and yet they haven't followed what's been prescribed for them. So it's not just that severity is coming to Pharaoh and his household. Severity is coming to Moses and his household. So there is, in a sense, equal treatment being brought forth to both of these leaders. And negligence and disobedience will be dealt with. Again, why is this here? What is going on? Of all the commentators, of all the theologians, of all the people I listened to and read, I believe Jen Wilkin has the best, the best commentary as to why is this here? What is going on? What was God trying to do? Let me read for you. Why is there blood, she asks? Why is the parting of flesh? Why is this happening? And yet what Zipporah does when she takes the foreskin with the blood on it and it touches him, apparently it delivers his life 
Are you following what just happened here, she asked. God seeks to put Moses, or son, to death. Zipporah intercedes on his behalf with the blood of someone else, and God spares Moses' life. This is a picture of atonement. But not just for here, not just for this point in the story, but think ahead, she says. You don't think that on another night in the not-too-distant future as Moses is commanding the nation of Israel to place blood on the doorposts because death hovers nearby? That Moses doesn't think back to this moment when the blood of another delivered him from certain death? God is putting in place a picture of what redemption, future redemption, will look like for his people. Moses has this story, this background, this picture of God, how of how God saved him, and he will be able to remember that, recall that, and utilize that in a later account. We'll get there, not today, but we will get there. Scene number five. The Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he met Moses at the mountain of God and kissed him. Then Moses told Aaron everything the Lord had sent him to say, and also about all the signs he had commanded him to perform. And so you have between Midian, where he was coming from, up to Egypt, you have this mountain. And so you have, just imagine in your mind, Aaron and the, and the Israelite elders coming to meet him halfway, and you got Moses setting out with his family to, to, to meet Aaron, and then there in the middle, between the two of them, is Mount Sinai, this great Tobies, this great halfway point between Minneapolis and Duluth is, <laughs> you know to stop because there's caramel rolls, or God has something special plan for them there, okay? I heard, I heard some groans, sorry. Um, of all the things to groan about, uh, that, that, continuing on, final scene here. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people, and here, they believed and when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshiped. Significant foreshadowing. Because this sounds like it's going to be easy. And it's not. Again, back to the New American Commentary. Verse 31 describes the Israelites' conversion to faith in Yahweh, evidenced by the posture of bowing before God, not Moses, uh, as the people signed that they believed in and accepted the demands of his words and promises for them. They likely had no knowledge of his name prior to this, any more than Moses had had before his encounter at Sinai, and no previous idea that he was their national God who had chosen them as his people, which is what was concerned about them and had seen their misery implies. Moses tells the reader in verse 31 that the Israelites trusted in Yahweh before, uh, for their salvation. This trust was soon to be sorely tested. Great foreshadowing, great storytelling, and now they are at the place where they're ready to go to Egypt. Now, I want to come back to the original question. What was that? Why not just get from Midian to Egypt? Why have all of these interspersed scenes and accounts? Why? And I want to kind of draw again. We're in this and looking at it from a gospel perspective. Let me just hit three. Any one of which I'd ask you to give consideration in your own life of just how this might connect to the gospel story and the gospel being connected to your life, to your week, Okay? going to look at the blood of Christ, God's firstborn, and God's authority in brief um, succession here. Number one, I want to go back to the quote from Jen Wilkins. She talks about blood bringing forth atonement. Now, if you know the gospel story, this is no surprise. Let me take you to Romans chapter 3. God presented Christ on the cross as a sacrifice of atonement, as, as a covering, as a shield. Through the shedding of his blood to be received by you and I through faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness. Why? Because in his forbearance, in his divine patience, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Now, blood covering, blood bringing forth atonement, Blood saving us. Whose blood? The blood of Christ. Now, listen, if we're going to talk about justice or injustice, 
Was it just for Jesus, who was sinless, to die on behalf of sinful people? Is that just? What makes it just is because God said so. God says right there, I do this so as to be just. And the one who justifies, the one who saves, the one who forgives. How? Through the shed blood of Christ. Blood covering, blood atoning is used throughout the scriptures as a way to bring us to the cross of Christ, pointing us forward to what Jesus has done. That's number one. Does the blood cover you? Are you trusting in it to be your atonement, your covering, your protection, your shield, your salvation this morning? Two, let's look at firstborn. One more quote from the New American Commentary. The firstborn son in the ancient world was the one specifically favored with inheritance, the one who would represent the father in many ways as he came into maturity, and the father gave him more and more responsibility. Moreover, in ancient Israel society, the firstborn son, as the first fruits of a marriage, was devoted to God. He belonged specially to God and could not even be taken and raised by his parents without the payment of a special redemption or buyback fee that was symbolized uh, as the family's recognition that the son was by rights Yahweh's and not theirs. Several passages in the New Testament identify Jesus as the firstborn. One example is in Colossians chapter 1. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. So Jesus being described as firstborn, if we take that comment that I just made from the New American Commentary, that Jesus is the firstborn son, the one specially favored with inheritance, the one who would represent the Father in many ways. Does Jesus not say that? I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That the Father gives the firstborn more and more responsibility. I give him all authority. And then ultimately, Jesus will give that authority back to the Father. And it says the firstborn is devoted to God. In this sense, we see Jesus as the greatest, the chief of firstborns. Israel's called to be that firstborn. They will fail again and again and again. And then you have Jesus who will become true Israel, the firstborn, who's able to carry out the work of God perfectly. And one more, God's authority. I want to remind you of the words of our Kenyan friend. What God says is right. Friends, I don't say that to be flippant. As a preacher, to beat you up if you feel beat down. But I want us to remember that what God says is right, but it's also good, it's also holy. It's for your welfare and your benefit. And to these questions, who are you to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Friends, does not the potter have the right? What's the answer to that question? Does God have the right? Yes. He does. Is that easy on us when we can't always understand his plans or his ways that we want to scream out, God, what was that? One of the things that I'll take away from the life of Billy Graham is the number of times, which uh, admittedly, I didn't hear him as maybe as many as you, but the number of times that he would say in a sermon, in a message, the Bible says, The Bible says, the word of God says, God says, God's word says, again and again, the authority of God being brought forth through his word. Does not God have the right to say those things? To do those things? Does the potter not have the right? I know your heart and I know the challenge of this because it is my heart and my challenge. I want to know his ways. I want to Search out his judgments. I want to sit in counsel over God at times and tell him how to do his job. Tell him where he might be failing, falling short.
start to question, did God really say that? And in so doing, I mimic the words of the serpent in the garden. Did God really say that? That can't be true, really? Moses thinking, that circumcision thing, is that still important? Is that still going on? That whole love your neighbor thing, is that still valuable? That trusting in the blood of Christ, that's archaic. That's barbaric. Come on, is that still a value today? We're, we're modern people. We've outgrown that. That's animalistic. That's crazy. We say in the words, laud and honor. Laud and honor to the Father and to the Son and to the Spirit. We can say that because of what we've seen in the cross. And we can say it and trust God in those areas where we have concerns and questions. Let's pray together. God, right now we preach to our hearts and we let your word speak to our minds. We want to sit underneath the teaching of the Bible, not sit over the teaching of the Bible. And so help us, even as we respond in song, to do that, to let your word speak, to worship you, God, because of what we know definitively because of the cross and yet to trust you with our questions and our concerns. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen.